As we continue to learn more this evening about the Orlando nightclub shooting and the gunman, the director of the FBI says that the shooter expressed support for a jumble of often conflicting Islamic organizations. He said Omar Mateen called 911 during the attack and not only pledged his loyalty to the Islamic State, but also expressed solidarity with the Brotherhood of ISIS as well. And he expressed solidarity with those who carried out the Boston bombing, the marathon bombing. The FBI investigated Mateen for 10 months, beginning in May of 2013. Mateen claimed that he made the remarks because co-workers were teasing him because he's, he was Muslim. Uh, as for whether the FBI should have done anything differently, Director James Comey says, so far, he really doesn't think so. We have a very distinguished panel of experts here to talk more about this. Joining us are Kent Alexander, the U.S. Attorney at the time of the Centennial Olympic Park bombing, Jamie Ferguson, Director of Atlanta Pride, Samaya Khalifa, Founder and Executive Director of the Islamic Speakers Bureau, and John Monroe from Georgia Carey, who has been here many times before. Thanks so much for joining us. Also joining us from Washington, D.C., Republican Congressman Barry Laudermilk, Laudermilk from Georgia's 11th Congressional District. And we're going to start right there with the Congressman. Uh, you served on Homeland Security Task Force and Terror and Foreign Fighters. Uh, the President said that there is uh, no clear evidence that the shooter was directed by outside forces. So. How concerning is that for you? How, how do we deal with that? Well, the, the, the big problem that we have right now is a lack of priority, I think, from the administration on addressing these. Um, yeah, there may not be a link that we know immediately that he was directed by outside force, sources, but we do know the ideology that was behind it. Mm -hmm. We do know that this is falling in line with the Chattanooga type attack, uh, the Garland, Texas uh, attack. These are the, uh, some have, uh, have uh, deemed as uh, lone wolf attacks. These are individuals who are acting out under this, the extreme ideology that we've seen before with the idea of killing Americans. And so we have to take this in that approach is that it is an extreme ideology that is driving uh, these perpetrators to go out and kill Americans. Congressman, the shooter was able to buy these guns legally. Even if the FBI ends up investigating him because he had no charges on his record whatsoever, should background checks be changed so that you have more scrutiny on somebody who at least was on an FBI wanted list or FBI watch list? Well, if, it depends on what watch list he was on. Clearly, the FBI had determined that you know, through their investigations, they didn't think he was an immediate threat. This is where I think we've got the problem. You know, the president of the United States uh, initiated an executive order on guns to hire 200 more ATF agents to go after uh, gun owners when he could have used those, a those agents in the Homeland Security to go after terrorists. Instead of hiring 230 more administrators in the FBI, we could have hired more FBI agents. The FBI is stretched to the max. That's why they, they have to prioritize who they're going after, who they're investigating, who, who is the most significant significant threat. That's uh, one of the reasons I'm sure that they didn't pursue the, uh, the investigations on these guys. Administration instead has cut $599 million from the Department of Homeland Security budget for this coming year and has moved a lot of that money to climate change. This is why I'm saying it's a priority issue. It isn't about background checks. It's about going after the people who are perpetrating these acts of evil on Americans. All right, John Monroe with Georgia Carey, i got to ask you, bring you in on this inev inevitably. Uh, gun, gun control comes up whenever we have instances like this. So would you be in favor of any kind of uh, stricter controls on the purchasing of guns? And what about assault uh, rifles, the assault weapon that was used in this uh, tragedy, been used in so many others prior to that? Well, I'd have to know what the proposal was in terms of additional background checks. So you would be open? Well, I'd be to open something. to it, certainly. Okay. But uh, from all we know, um, this guy had no uh, prior criminal history, and the FBI had investigated right. him and determined there was nothing uh, that warranted further investigation. So there's no reason why he would have been denied uh, a gun well, purchase. What about a ban on assault weapons? Well, assault weapon is a, is a term that's been invented to describe cosmetic features of a normal semi-automatic rifle. Um, they're, they're they shoot faster than a pistol. I don't know a lot about guns, but I'm thinking they shoot faster than a pistol. No, that's not true. They, they fire as fast as your, trigger, uh, your finger can pull a trigger. That's true of a semi-automatic pistol as much as a semi-automatic rifle. In fact, the only difference between a rifle and a pistol is one has a shoulder stock and one doesn't. All right, so you would not be in favor of, of banning any kind of weapon, particularly an assault weapon that we're talking about here? No, it wouldn't make any difference. All right. There is no common ground, essentially, between your side 
and between those on the left who want to try and make sure that the Second Amendment is not an overreach. Do you agree with that? I mean, look, Robert Kennedy was shot almost 48 years ago this week. And the arguments with then, a revolver. The arguments then were the same as they are now. I mean, nothing has really changed. Nothing has been decided. Those who were for gun control and those who were against it, you know, through the generations mm -hmm. seem to be pretty much as they were. Yeah, Robert Kennedy was uh, assassinated with a, a revolver, not a semi-automatic pistol or rifle. Um, John Kennedy was shot with a bolt-action rifle, again, not a semi-automatic. But the issue there was gun control. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking the specifics of how a, 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 you know, a gun is operated as much as I am the deadly force that was invoked here. Where people want some kind of control, others do not, there is no middle ground in this. But Brenda's question was pointed at the features of, of a gun, uh, assault weapon, and, yes. that, and that conjures up certain features of it, such as being a semi-automatic rifle and, all, and whether it has a, a forward pistol grip and things like I that. I want to get Ken Alexander in on this conversation. What do you have to add? Help us out here we're, we're, while we're talking about gun control, because we have so many other things uh, to talk about as well, not the least of which is uh, religion, but gun control. Sure. Well, I think uh, Jeff's question really got it, at it. There's, there's got to be some middle ground, and it's not just everybody compromised in the middle, but I think mm -hmm. if we stand, start with the basic premise, nobody wants uh, terrorists to have guns. Nobody wants uh, people who are suspected, seriously suspected of terrorists, who would otherwise maybe be on a watch list to have guns. I think we start with that premise, and I think everybody agrees to that, I mean, everybody on the panel, then work backwards from there, and how can we put things in place when it comes to uh, automatic weapons or semi-automatic weapons? Uh, probably the, the key is the clips. If you have 15, 30, 60 rounds to a, to a weapon, it's a lot easier shoot folks. It's not to say that every, all, all guns can't be banned. They shouldn't be banned. But people, certain people shouldn't have them. You were the U.S. attorney when we had the Centennial Olympic bombing here in, in 96. So what mm -hmm. lessons did we learn, if uh, any, from that? Well, uh, you learned a, bun a bunch of lessons. Uh, one, not to rush your judgment on people like Richard Jewell. Two, there are lone wolves like Eric Rudolph who committed that crime. He committed the Sandy Springs abortion clinic crime. He committed the other side lounge bombing, which was now 19 years ago, which was Atlanta's uh, very uh, you know, shadow, uh, small, small, small version of community. Orlando. And, what, and you know, a difference between uh, just, as I think about it, when it comes to any type of device, be it a bomb, be it a semi-automatic weapon in the hands of a terrorist, be it a lone wolf or somebody affiliated with ISIS, uh, we don't want that person having it. So Maya, I've got to bring you in. All right, let's, let's switch gears here and talk a little bit about religion. Uh, what do you say to Muslims uh, who embrace this sort of, or who, rather I should say, who don't embrace this sort of hatred, uh, yet who are fearful in the wake of all of these terrorist attacks? What do you say to them, and what do you say to Americans who blame Muslims for this? Well, first of all, I want to give my condolences to the family and friends, families and friends of the victims, Orlando victims in the LGBT com uh, community. Uh, we're going through a very rough time as a nation and as a community. Um, the Muslim community uh, is under attack. Uh, it's been under attack for a long time. And what's really interesting is when somebody who happens to identify as a Muslim uh, does something horrible, we immediately, as a nation, as people, blame the ideology as the congressman did. Well, a year ago, just less than a year ago, when we had the Charleston shooting, uh, we did not blame that uh, particular faith tradition for what that person did. Uh, so we need to kind of wake up and look at that and see what double standards, because that double standards uh, marginalizes people and it drives them to terrorism. And we don't want to do that. Jamie, how about the issues for the LGBT community? You're talking about, you know, this occurs inside of a dance club on you know, a wonderfully festive night known as Latin night. Is there a sense of fear now in the community around the country that you could become targets because some individuals simply take issue with how you lead your lives? Yes and no. I think that uh, LGBT people, particularly LGBT people of color, as were most of the victims in this particular bombing, are used to dealing with issues of safety and security at our gatherings. We have unfortunately been targets for a long time. There's a long history of uh, bombings and fires in uh, in gay bars specifically. Uh, so safety is always at top of mind. At Atlanta Pride, which is the largest convening of LGBT people in the Southeast, we worry about safety every year. It's always top of mind. And so incidents like this certainly spark our collective trauma and make us rethink our policies and make us 
um, ensure that we're doing the best we can for our community, but we're also a really resilient and bright community, and we won't be silenced by fear. Uh, Where does it put you on the timeline of progress here? Uh, you've, you've, the LGBTQ community has made a lot of progress, uh, both, uh, I guess, legally and socially. And then this happens, uh, and I saw a lot of people, uh, several tweets from people who talked about the fear of coming out and how you know, they've been able to come out more and more in a more uh, receptive society, and now something like this happens. Does that take you back? I don't think it takes us back, um, but the progress is not linear, I think, for, for any group of people. And the sad irony is this is Stonewall Month. A absolutely. Yeah, right. um, we've certainly made some important legal gains uh, in recent years, and uh, those deserve to be celebrated. But uh, there are still elected officials who feel that it's appropriate to tweet that um, you know, gay people are committing crimes worthy of death in the United States. There are elected officials who have tweeted that the people in the bar got what they deserved. So we live in this culture, and it, and it has changed in some ways, but hasn't changed in others. What do you think American Muslims need to do to give the view to many Americans that they are indeed assimilating into this culture, to make sure that they understand that there are millions of Muslims in this country who contribute financially, who contribute socially, that contribute in so many ways that may be lost on the eyes and ears of so many people in this country when these horrific, eye, these horrific events are committed by one deranged person. Well, uh, the Muslim community right now in Orlando and all over the country, uh, there is a fund sourcing uh, campaign that's going on to collect money, donations for the victims' families in Orlando. I just got an email today. Do you think uh, there needs to be louder voices from the Muslim community? The voices are there. The problem is they're not being heard. Why are they not being or, heard? Uh, I think yeah. uh, we need to look at the media and other outlets. Why are those voices not there? But they're definitely out there on social media, and people need to look for them because they are not part of the main uh, mainstream conversation. Uh, Blood drives are being uh, promoted within the Muslim community for the victims. Um, money is being collected, and it's really, um, they're making the best out of a really bad situation. And the LGBT community has come out, and we were so worried about the victims and their families, and the LGBT community came out and said, well, we're worried about the backlash for the Muslim community. Mm. So this is an absolute beautiful relationship between the two communities that we need to be looking at. Absolutely. We're running out of time, and I want to get our congressman back in on the conversation. So, uh, Congressman, uh, how do you reconcile Americans' fears about terror with the fears that Muslim Americans and the LGBTQ community might have after an incident like this? How do you reconcile those? Well, first of all, let me uh, let me clarify something that uh, I believe must have been misunderstood because when I talked about ideology earlier, I said extreme ideology. Uh, I specifically said extreme ideology. Any ideology that perpetrates hate and uh, death as its its core values, that's what I'm talking about. I got friends in the Muslim community back in uh, in my home state of Georgia um, that, and I appreciate uh, how they are coming about and they're they're promoting what their beliefs are, as some it may say more moderate beliefs. We're talking about organizations such as ISIS, such as Al Qaeda, uh, many other terrorist organizations who are promoting uh, death and destruction because of who we are as Americans. You know, as we go across and we look at Garland, Texas, you look at Paris, France, you look at um, Brussels, Belgium, and Chattanooga, Tennessee, these are all perpetrated by people with the same goal as advancing their hate against those who, who have a level of freedom and liberty as we have here. And I think what we need to do is we need to show the American people that, that we are investing in their safety and security all across the board. And, and I think it's really been a failure of this administration more than anything, is that our enemies don't fear us, our, our friends don't know when to trust us, and the American people uh, have rated uh, this administration very low on protecting their safety and security because as we've seen, uh, uh, other policies, such as climate change, uh, admittedly, have taken the, uh, the attention and the resources of the federal government. We've passed several bills in Congress already, I've passed some, that uh, would improve the security and the safety of American people. But uh, we're still having a problem getting them through because the president has threatened to veto. Well, Congressman, I have to ask you, how do you bridge the divide between Americans who, who want to ban Muslims and those Muslims who are living in our country and contributing to the economy of this country? Uh, this is what we, I mean by how do you reconcile the two? How, how do you bridge that divide? 
we're not going to be able to reconcile it until we uh, we get off the idea of political correctness and and uh, we go after the ideology that is behind the death and destruction. As long as we keep playing political correctness games in Congress and throughout the United States, we're going to see the same thing happen, regardless of who the victims are. So the, the only way we can reconcile is to come together and we identify those. Look, I was not a proponent of, of banning Muslims from coming into the nation. One of the primary reasons is how do you prove it? You can't prove religion. You can prove uh, national origin. I'm, I believe we can uh, put a ban on those that are coming from those areas that we know are trying to exploit our refugee system, from those that we know that Al Qaeda, ISIS are trying to infiltrate people into the United States. I think we should do a higher level of screening and possibly even ban those, but not just based on religion. And I think when we, we have to come together as Americans and identify that these people are out to destroy us, and unless we put the political correctness behind us and actually look at the ideology, look at what they're trying to do, uh, and come together as Americans uh, and, and get the administration on board, we're going to see more of these attacks. Congressman Barry Loudermilk, thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. We want to thank our panelists here in the studio as well for being with us. Uh, as we knew from the start, mm -hmm. we would not have enough time to talk about all the details of this and all of the various issues that are raised when we have such a horrific event like we did in Orlando. But again, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. We're going to take a break. We'll be back shortly. <laughs>